Hello, and welcome to Answer Everywhere. This is an improvised live channel where every week, unencumbered by any sort of preparation process, we dig into a popular code base and try to look at the code, see what makes it tick, and uh, try to learn what we can learn. Today, we're taking a look at a project called Ghidra, which is a re reverse engineering and disassembly tool that was made by the uh, folks at the National Security Agency, uh, commonly known as the NSA. So um, I've never really used Ghidra. I've never done any uh, disassembly. I've never really been on that side of security in general. So I'm coming to this as, a, um, as an outsider. And um, I imagine there are people who are going to watch this who have much more of an idea of what's going on. And so if you have anything um, cool to share, why don't you let me know in the, in the comments or if you're watching live in the chat. I did, however, download Ghidra and we can run it. I made a super secret program that we can try to disassemble. And here's what the program does. You um, give it a number. And it will tell you whether it's too rectangular rectangly for it. Um, some numbers it likes. Like the number um, 11 it likes. And I have somewhere a good num that it likes, 27847. So it should tell me that this is a, a rare gem. And so if we have this uh, binary um, and we want to open it, we can load it up into Ghidra. We can create a project. And um, I've already created the project and imported uh, a.out. And when I do that, it tells me that it hasn't been analyzed. Would I like to try it? I click yes. I click analyze. And it's got a bunch of analyzers. Um, and we'll see this as we look at the code, I assume. But um, just to look at, just to check some of the analyzers so we might recognize them when we're peering into the code. We see things like demangler, GNU, um, a call fix up installer, call convention, ASCII stuff, some stack stuff. Um, and I can click analyze. Um, yeah, sure. And it will give me the assembly view on what all my code is. You see some sort of thunk function. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't, I don't know, um, uh, machine code or assembly, uh, very well. So, uh, but, and it will also decompile it into something that looks C like over here. And as we get a sense of like what's going on in our program, we can look at things like functions and see if I can find a function that that's recognizable to me. Um, it's not clear what that function is doing. But here, this seems to be the main function. We have some um, some calls to like printf to enter a number and some messages. And so um, you can click on these variables, like local 20 is just some temporary variable because it doesn't have the symbols that you would need to, to actually uh, make this be correct. And so I could call this bad message. Um, and I can rename this to like good message. And yeah, you can see like a, as we do this, the, the code comes like a, a little bit more readable um, at a time. And so we can see that there's some, uh, the first check is we check if some um, IVAR1 is zero or IVAR1 is equal to this function. It's gonna take some, whatever local 28 is and the number 100. Um, and I bet we can go uh, maybe dig into this function somewhere. So here's the function, the, the first thing that it calls and it does some stuff. It's got some longs. And it's checking whether um, the the uh, the parameter one is less than uh, two. So I actually know that this is number, but the number is less than two. Or um, if we end it with one and we get zero, uh, we return zero. Uh, I think this is the return value. Return new var two. So we can call this a like return value. And just we can do this and try to figure out. Um, what this code is up to. So this is Ghidra, and we could kind of just poke around the UI to see what else um, is available to us as uh, Ghidra users. Um, we have things like tools. There's a there's a good talk on um, what Ghidra is about. It's kind of architecture, why they built it, 
and how they open sourced it. The talk was done at Black Hat in 2019, and I've linked to it in the uh, in the show notes. Um, and you can you can click on that. I guess I don't know what block flow and code flow do, but they might be cool. It's going to generate some graph, and this graph is some sort of block flow graph. I'm not sure exactly what block flow is as, as opposed to something else. And then we can generate code flow as well. And I think one of these should be like which functions kind of depend on each other. I don't know how I can zoom in. This makes it wider, but there's some method for zooming in. Uh, okay, so this is this is Ghidra. This is what it what its look and feel is like. And so we can jump into the code and take a look at it. Um, I've got a few different ways of looking at the code. I've got GitHub open. Um, GitHub search is non-functional uh, for um, if you're not logged in, which I'm uh, not. And so uh, that's, I'm not going to use it much, but we can at least check what languages things are written in. We have 85.8% um, Java, some C++, some C, and then things like HTML and Python and Shell, which are probably used for things like documentation and um, tests and all that sort of stuff. They do support um, scripting in Python. So that I think the way they do that is with some um, some like Python to Java bindings. Um, and we may see some of that. And then I also have it open in um, source graph. Although I think the way that I want to look at it is probably just an Emacs. Um, OK, so I'm in the Ghidra. So if I go to the, this is the root of the, of the repo. And um, I think the action really is all in Ghidra. And we have things like debug, extensions, configurations, features, framework, processors, runtime scripts, and tests. So we saw, these, we saw things called analyzers. I expect somewhere to be there, there to be some sort of directory of analyzers. And we also, um, from, the, from the talk, I gathered that one thing that they had to do, apparently they wrote this in like the early 2000s, um, when maybe Java Swing was not as capable as it is today. I'm not sure. I'm not a Swing user. I hope it's capable <laughs> these days. But they extended a bunch of the, the Java framework um, like primitives, the, the, the Java Swing primitives. And so if we go back here, um, like everything that's a list, they have some like Ghidra list or like G list, they call it. And then they presumably have some sort of um, like Ghidra text pane um, and all of that sort of stuff. So we should see a lot of that UI stuff. I'm mostly going to skip that because that should be um, relatively straightforward. I think the the thing that Geetra is really bringing to the table is more the the, the disassembly features. Um, I'm not sure what's more important: uh, extensions, features, framework, or processors. But I imagine that one of them is important. Let's go ahead and look in. I guess framework. And in framework, we see DB. So there's some database that they that they talked about in the um, in the Black Hat talk. And that database, uh, I think, stores things like um, as they're disassembling the like things like annotations. Like when I renamed the variables, those should be stored there. Um, and you know, as it's disassembling the like the Java classes it finds, I think are probably stored in, in that database. I don't know what docking is. I'm not really sure what they're doing with emulation. File system should probably be just utilities. Um, GUI, I'm going to peek into just because I assume that this is where things like the, um, the swing stuff is. So we have swing exception handler, framework options. Options is not so cool. What about util? Okay, so we have things like task utilities. So I, I think this is safe to ignore. What is generic? We have things like theme and test. Okay. So I'm going to just ignore GUI, I think, for the most part. Um, and see, we have software modeling. And this thing called Slay. I guess we should look at Slay. At least we should look at what it is. Um, my understanding is it's what they use um, in Ghidra to essentially model different kinds of processors. Um, I guess just Slay Ghidra. E-compiler, building Slay. Slay is a machine language translation and disassembly engine. Slay is both a processor specification language. So this is the language that you specify what a processor is and the associated library and tools for using such a specification to generate assembly and generate P code. 
a reverse engineering register transfer language. So they have some register language, I guess. I don't know what it. Um, so there's there are various notions of languages. Um, I'm not sure. No, sorry, maybe register machine. There's various notions of machines. Um, I don't know if a register transfer language um, is like a a language in the in the sense of a register machine, but we can check out what it is. It's a kind of intermediate representation that is very close to assembly, such that it uh, as that which is used in a compiler. It's used to, define, to describe flow at the register transfer level. And in digital circuit design, the register transfer level is a design abstraction that models synchronous data circuit in terms of the flow of digital signals, uh, in parentheses, data, between hardware registers and the logical operations performed on those signals. And um, it, the, this is the abstraction used in things like um, Verilog and VHDL. So when you're designing a circuit, this is the sort, this is the, uh, I guess, I, this is not my field, but my understanding is that this is the abstraction you use to, to, to design a piece of hardware. So you would, you would write that in Verilog or VHDL. And what, um, what Slay is doing is somehow revert, is, is using the same sort of abstraction um, and is giving you a way to, to model various different architectures. So that's Slay. And we see here slay.launch. Presumably this is going to launch Slay. Oh, it's XML. Beautiful. Um, I'm not going to read raw XML though. Um, and so now we're peeking into software modeling. We get Antler and I'm feeling the need to like branch out more than, um, an editor like Emacs is giving me. So maybe what I'll do is we'll try the next, the next step up is maybe, how, I don't know. Mm, I don't know how the, if I like the tabs in, in IntelliJ enough, but. Let's, I guess, let's, let's jump to source graph. Source graph at least gives like a sort of GitHub kind of feel, but with working, um, working search. So where was I? I was in, um, something software modeling. Okay. So let's just check out software modeling. What? Don't you dot, dot, dot me. Okay. Um, and we, so we see some interesting things. One is Antler. Antler is um, a, a thing that I've looked at before on this channel, um, Antler 4. I can throw that video down in the, um, in the show notes. And Antler is used to, it's like a, I think it's like a parser generator. It's used to describe programming languages. Um, you write some sort of grammar and it like, I think writes a parser for it, kind of like Yak and Bison. Um, and so what are we, what are they doing with Antler is my question. The Java port of the Slay compiler has been refactored some. This is in preparation for the addition of the new with block, perhaps some background as to why. Then we get some problem description. That's nice. That's a nice comment. I'm actually interested in this enough to, to read it later. Um, okay. So, and then we've got some, some, uh, well, I guess we're in the grammar folder. Is it just this readme? Oh no, the readme is just on top and is huge. Okay. I guess GitHub puts the readme on the bottom for a reason, namely that it's not, it's a little bit disorienting if the readme, you have to like scroll down like half a page to see stuff. But we get things like a lexer, um, which will be used for lexing. And then we get like a slate compiler. I don't know what this .g um, suffix is, but maybe tree grammar slate compiler. Okay, and so uh, should we look at the lexer? Maybe we have tokens. Um, we the tokens are things like, I guess op is maybe an operation. And we have things like less than equal to whatever space <laughs> space mods space mods is a good name. It's maybe a decent band name. All right, things like hex, um, negate, not equal to some a bunch of logicy stuff, and then. Um, we have, I guess, reserved words and keywords, things like context, build, cross build, define. So this is, um, this is for doing slay stuff, I guess. And that was, that was antler, right? And so let's take a look at Java Ghidra still in software modeling. We have app P code 
Pcode Seaport Program, Service, Slay, and Util. I guess we'll look at Slay since we um, just look at it. But before that, we will look at Software Modeling Initializer Java. We definitely have the Java insanely long name naming convention. And this is just a small, tiny thing. It's going to implement module initializer, and it just has this run function, which is just going to reinitialize with defined, user defined character sets. And um, we can get its name. So that's not so exciting. And then Slay has a, a grammar, some antler stuff, an abstract Slay lexer, more lexing stuff, etc. Slay token. So, um, yeah. And then um, let's look at app P code and program, and maybe also service. So app, we have merge plugin and util. What is merge? Data type manager owner. This is just like a little tiny Java file. Java has like, tends to have a, a lot of directories very directory heavy language. Um, and then we have this plugin core. So I'm guessing that app plugin core is going to be um, actually the, the real entry point to the, the plugin system. And so my understanding based on the, the talk that I linked to is that um, the plugin system um, works by dynamically loading Java uh, classes. And so I'm not sure if we'll, we will see some of that here. And then there's some Python implementation that I think works by like Python of, by Javafying Python. And here we just have reference address pair, program provider context, and data manager with an archive folder. So th there is really nothing, nothing too much here in the software modeling, I, I don't think. But we'll look at program provider context. It implements data type provider context. We can get type component, get data, get unique name. Um, Built-in source archive. Yeah, so this, I, I feel like we're not quite yet at a place where there's there's interesting, um, there's really interesting code. Maybe in disassembly, how about disassembler.java? Is this a big file? This is a pretty big file. Um, do I get somewhere like some symbols? Okay. We have a bunch of disassembles. Are these functions? Okay. So we have a bunch of disassemble functions. I guess these are all overloaded. Um, this one disassembles code starting at the start address and restricted to address set. So you give it some address set view here. Note, a single instance of this disassembler does not support concurrent invocations of the various disassemble methods. Disassemble must, disassembler must be instantiated with a program object. We've got some program object. I think that um, th maybe this is a program object. Like I, I uploaded some program or imported some program and it's gonna create some, um, some view of that. I, th I think that's the sort of thing it is. Or is, it, is that just a file? I think I imported a file. So I'm not sure yet what a program is, but we'll look at program. Um, and then this is gonna do some sort of disassembly and how does it do that? It's gonna create some address set stuff. We're gonna get the starting address and we'll look at the alignment. And we have a disassembler queue that is parameterized by the start address and the restricted set. Where did we get the restricted set? Is that just from the that was passed in, yeah. That's stop that. That's what's, that's what's passed in here. Um, so I guess so. There's a per like the stuff among the stuff you pass in. There's like a per that thing queue, and we have a dumb buffer. <laughs> we have to look at the dumb buffer implementation. Can I copy the link here? I don't want it to take over this window. The dumb buffer implementation. And uh, let's see, it extends memory buffer implementation with an internal cache buffer a size of 16 bytes that will use the underlying memory if needed. All right, I don't know what, 
I guess, is that opposed to smart buffer or is it like, you know, is, is the whole implementation poorly conceived and like hacky? I'm not sure what dumb is supposed to mean in that context. Um, but then we, whatever seed context is, maybe that's like the initial context that we're extending. And we check if the, the seed is null. And then while, um, while the disassembler queue is still producing stuff, we're going to uh, do we're going to do this try block, which I'm going to guess is the the main disassembly thing. So we're going to get next block to be disassembled, and then if it's null, then we uh, break, go back to the beginning, and then we get the start address of the block, and then we get the code unit by calling listing get code unit at block address. This seems like this is. Can I open this? No. All right. Um, and then, then if it's an instruction, if the code unit's an instruction, we continue. Skip call point silently if it was previously disassembled. Otherwise, um, if it's not data, or um, when we cast it to data, the C the code unit is defined. I'm not sure really what that means. We check then we check if it's null, and there might be some call conflict. And then if we're done here, we try to disassemble the next instruction set. And then we add instructions to the program. If instruction set, if the instruction set has more than zero in, uh, size, I guess, instruction count, then, uh, sorry about the, the hovers. I'm trying to point at things, but it keeps blocking them with the, uh, with the, uh, the CSS hover thing there. Um, then we get the, the, the new disassembler addresses from the listing and we do a bunch of stuff really disassemble addresses <laughs> really disassemble addresses seems important um again i'm I, I feel a little bit like it's hard to um open this up in the background without taking over my window so i'll try i'll try that um and then we add instructions to some disassembly thing so this is doing some real disassembly i'm not quite sure where the where the real work is is done, but um, the really disassemble seems important as does um, some of the other stuff we saw up here. So let's see if we can go back and find some of the stuff I was looking at. So the disassembler queue is going to um, tell you whether things are, are available to, to disassemble. So I think that that's gonna be implement, um, interesting. Yeah, I figured that's what would happen, okay. I guess I can copy link and open it in the background. And uh, the get flow context value. The, this is like the seed, the, the seed context is, is something that we have, sorry, the seed is something we've extended from a seed context. And so that might be important as well. Um, I'm not sure where that comes from, but can I go back to where it was? Okay. And this is the continue processing instruction set seems important, but that's part of disassembler queue, which I've already opened, et cetera. So I think maybe disassembler queue is important, is, is the next thing to look at. And then where did listing come from? Maybe go to definition. Okay, let's look at listing as well. I guess I'll just let it take over this, this window. So this thing's an interface and it's got a tree name, the function get code unit at. So you're, so it's an interface, so you're gonna implement this. Something's gonna implement this um, and things like get code unit containing. And so let's look at get code unit at address. Let's find references. Okay, so you have stub listing. That's probably not the listing I want. Um, the Gitter program model stub listing, block flow. 
Oh, these are just calling. Uh, no, I want implementations. Can I jump to implementation? Let's try IntelliJ. Did I just have been in IntelliJ all along? I'm not sure how to open a how to quickly open a file from from this interface, but let's try doing this. Oh, okay, that worked. All right, so if I um, go to get code unit at, I can hopefully do go to um, implementations. So we have listing DB, stub listing, and abstract. So maybe the listings are just um, containing the database. The listing DB is going to call, to implement get code unit at, it's going to call code manager get unit at address. So what is code manager? Code manager is whatever this thing is. And when we um, set program, we're going to pass in a program TB, DB and the, it's going to contain a pointer to the code manager. So let's look at what the definition of code manager is. It is, it's a class as opposed to an interface. Does it have implementation stuff? Can I get, I want this to go away. Go away, whatever this is. All right. So code manager. Constructs a new code manager for, a, <laughs> yes, okay. Well, what is it, what is a, what is a code manager? Class to manage database tables for data and instruction. Okay, so really what's going on is we're just pulling stuff from the database. And so that's, that's not so interesting unless we know like how do we how are we populating the database in the first place so at some point we should see um some database population code but we will um we'll leave code manager here and maybe come back to it and all right and so let's let's plow along and see what else we see so i'm still kind of getting a feel for um how the how things are laid out. Sometimes with these Java pro projects, you get um, um, a lot of the a lot of the actual implementation is just kind of fanned out through a ton of directories, and um, there's just a bunch of inheritance that kind of gets in the way of understanding um, how the program is written. That's not inherent to Java. There's a lot of like very readable and very understandable Java. But it does seem like a problem, does seem like a thing that Java is, is prone to if you're not a little bit careful. Um, so we're now in software modeling, source, main, Java, Ghidra, service, graph. This, this is graph stuff, things like graph display. Graph display listener, presumably is going to listen for stuff that happens with, with, with the graph or with the graph display. Um, edge graph, context, dummy graph, display listener. And some of this just seems a little bit like UI stuff. We've got a graph display provider um, extends extension points. So this, I guess, is presumably something you can extend. Basic interface for objects that can display or otherwise consume a generic graph. So maybe this is all kind of like um, UI stuff in the software modeling. Um, although we did see the disassembler. Do we have any UI code in here at all? In the disassembler. We have big integer a pseudo instruction, a bunch of stuff from Ghidra, um, Ghidra app util, Ghidra program model. That looks like a useful um, directory. In fact, we're gonna, let's jump to, let's jump to that all, uh, right away. Can I just go here? I'm not really sure how this navigation is working, but let's try program model. What? <laughs> As I'm typing, it's like overwriting the previous letter. I don't know why that's a thing. All right, whatever, whatever source graph. Um, okay. So here's model um, and model has things like address block correlate. So now we're seeing things that seem um, computery and architecture -y. and the, the listing 
and mem. I guess we'll look at listing and mem. Relock, scalar, and symbol. And we'll just poke around these. These should just be um, kind of you know what you expect. Ways ways to model these these computery things. So address. Let's look, look at address.java. An address represents a location in a program. Conceptually, addresses consist of an address space and an offset within that space. Many processors have only one real address space, but some have several spaces. Also, there are artificial address spaces used for analysis and representing other non-memory locations, such as a register or an offset on the stack relative to a function's frame pointer. Okay, so address extends comparable of address. I guess you can compare with other addresses. And you can get, we've got getters. We've probably got setters. We can get pointer size. We can get next. So they, they form some sort of like linked list. I'm guessing, um, I don't know if this means that like every address is like a memory cell and next just returns the next cell, but we can see what it says here. In most cases, this is equivalent to address.add1. Okay, yeah. But segmented addresses could span segments. The result of calling this on the highest address will result in a null return value. Okay, I guess highest address means that um, you start at zero. And so um, you know you're at the end when next returns null. Um, you can get previous, you can get the offset. So it's kind of like just modeling a Turing tape, essentially. Um, that I don't see anything to, to contradict that. And so we will, so is stack address, I guess, will return true if it's part of the stack. So that's kind of useful. So like, where are we, you know, we are at some point in memory, what's going on here? It might be the stack. Um, the hash address represents it in, in the hash space. I, I'm not sure what the hash space is, but um, maybe, maybe you do. Okay, so that's address. And then we have a bunch of other files um, that are just, presumably for working with addresses. For example, we have address range, that should be some rate, some like chunk of memory. And range chunker, similarly, whatever address set is, should be essentially, I think, a set of addresses, various collections of addresses, and so forth. Um, uh, a block, I guess, is a code block, judging from the name of <laughs> this file, code block, code block Java. Code block represents some group of instructions slash data. Each block has some set of source blocks that flow into it and some sort of destination blocks that flow out of it. Okay, so let's verify this with my, um, with my amazing secret program. So if we go to graph, we can see the block flow. Let me get another sip of water here. This is presumably the flows of the source block. So these should be just different, different blocks of code where um, I, can re I can reveal my secret code. So um, a code block is like, I assume, a, like a block of C in this case. And so these should correspond to, the, to those things. So if I click on one, um, does this work? Okay, so if I click on one, it like changes over here in this pane. So this one, um, oh, okay. So code block is, is I highlighted a function block, but um, like an if block is also a code block. And so here we have here, here, we have here else if long num is, is less than four, um, this is one, this is some code block. And maybe if I click on it, I can find out what code, what code block it is. Maybe properties. Uh, Something. Comments, find. Maybe I can find it. I don't know. At any rate, oh, uh, I guess it's, it's it's highlighted here. We have um, lab 001. I think that th this is, I guess, just some label, but maybe that's maybe that's what. Um, is that right? What did I click on? Lab 001. 0128C. Lab 001, 01 to 80. Oh, this is this is the um, this is the block. There's a label, and the, I guess that's a code block. Anyway, so that's modeled in this in the code, I guess, as a 
as this code block thing in this particular file. And it represents some group of instructions slash data. Each block has some source of blocks that flows into it. Um, how do we know what flows into it? I'm not sure if that's um, something that's immediately apparent from the uh, from this view. But once you have essentially this view, the um, the listing, I guess. Well, now I know what a listing is. And um, once you have the listing, uh, you should be able to, uh, you, you can compute the, the graph, right? Because you have these jump instructions. And I'm guessing that if we look at the graph, we should see um, some connection between lab 001, 01 to AE. Let's rename this to um, great lab. And let's rename this to next lab. And so I hope that um, the, <laughs> the this jump should basically be an edge on the graph and, and, and is, maybe, um, is maybe visible on this graph. Let's see if we can look at the block flow again. And see, here we see Great Lab. I don't know how to zoom in. I'm sure I could turn on um, like accessibility, but right here is, is Great Lab. And then Next Lab is down here. And so we don't get, as far as I can tell, a, a um, Um, a single, what's the word, uh, edge between these, but there is a path between them. Maybe the jump instruction gives us something else. So let's look at code flow. Whoa. How do I, how do I zoom out of this one? This is, this is intense. I'm not sure what's going on there. Didn't seem that big before. Okay. Um, I'm not, I can't read any of this, but um, at any rate, they have some way of building up the graph and uh, that's, that's somehow going to tell us what flows into it, I assume. All right, back to the code block. Each block has some set of source blocks that flow into it and some set of destination blocks that flow out of it. A block model is used to produce code blocks. Each model represents each model produces blocks based on its interpretations of instructions slash data grouping and flow between those. All right, so a code block extends address set view. So it's some view, I guess, on an address set, which makes sense. It can do addressy stuff, so it's a code block. You can ask like what part of memory it is in, like get first address and stuff like that. Um, this is this is an interface. Okay, so these are things that you have to implement if you're implementing code block. You can get flow type, whatever a flow type is. Let's see what flow type is. It's a class and not like an enum. Class to define flow types for instructions. How it flows from one instruction to the other to the next. I guess this is maybe how they, they build up the graph. Set has fall, set is call, set is jump. Okay, so I guess there are different ways to, to flow. Has fall is maybe to fall through, like in a case statement possibly. I don't know what else fall would be. A call is like a, presumably a function call. Um, is jump is presumably a jump instruction. Is terminal is maybe just the thing right before like the, the curly brace in a C-like language. Um, whether it's computed, maybe that's referring to like computed jumps. There's some conditional stuff. So that this is like conditional branching, I guess. And, um, we have some, some builder stuff going on. We get the builder, the builder pattern has fall through return as fall. So fall does seem to be fall through. Okay. So those are different ways to get from one code block to another. And what else can we do? You can get sources, get num destinations, get model, et cetera. Okay. Cool. Um, here's listing. Um, the listing is the thing that we, this is like the, this central pane. And actually now I'm noticing these, these arrows, right? So here's an interesting arrow. It goes down here and it's got a little loop annotation. I don't know if you can see that with the resolution of the, of the YouTube video, but then it goes out. Um, what does that mean? I don't know.
So there is a loop. So it's like a for loop. Um, I'm not sure how we know it's a it's a for loop. I guess we go back to the beginning of some thing in the in the label, but uh, I, I don't know enough about um, whatever this is called, the uh, um, machine code or assembly or whatever to to know um, to know for sure. But at any rate, this is the listing, and um, presumably this is going to be the implementation of the listing. We can do things like bookmark. Uh, let's see if I can figure out how to bookmark something. Bookmark, I'll control, I'll, um, category. Happy. One great bookmark. And so uh, I guess if you bookmark it, you get this little thing that looks like a purple butterfly. Um, so we have bookmarks, bookmark, bookmark manager, bookmark type, code unit, et cetera, data, Java. So this is, um, Stuff that I think is used for the UI. Um, here's mem. We have things like mem buffer memory. Let's look at memory.java, which is also going to extend address set view. We've got things like get block size. We can find out what program this memory belongs to, which is also useful if you have some chunk of memory to know, you know, what's what's here. Whether it's big endian. Um, Set live memory handler. I don't know what that is, but maybe that means that as you change memory, there's something that can react to it. I guess that might be my, what it means by live. And we have this create initialized block. We'll create, we should, should create some block of memory, etc. And memory block seems to be maybe almost the more fundamental type. So let's go to memory block. An interface that defines a block in memory. So how is this different from um, an address, it should be closely related to, to an address, I, I assume. A special purpose of uh, external block may be created by certain program loaders, e.g. ELF, to act as a stand-in for unknown external symbol locations. And relocation support is required using a valid memory address. While the external block is created out of necessity for relocation processing, it introduces a number of limitations when used to carry data symbols, where the pointer math and offset references may occur. Okay. So you can get the address range. You can get, so I asked how it was really, how a block of memory is related to addresses. One way is you can get the like underlying address range. Um, you can also do things like get size, but it sounds like what this comment is saying that is that um, sometimes before you have like an address, you may know that you have some memory block that, um, that it doesn't yet have an address and you may need to um, define it as a memory block without addresses. Okay. All right. And here's reloc, which should be relocatable code stuff. We have a public class relocation, which has a status. Did I just click on something? Okay. We have some um, enum, some status enum. The status can be unknown, skipped, unsupported, failure, partial, applied. Relocation was applied successfully and resulted in the modification of memory bytes, et cetera. So we're just kind of modeling, um, I guess, like what the code relocation is doing. All right. So that's, um, that's enough to give me a sense of what's going on in the software modeling um, folder. That seems really um, fundamental, but maybe a little bit close to the, U the, the UI, the GUI side. Um, I think we haven't seen yet. Uh, we saw like, le like lexers for Slay. I haven't seen yet a um, like a model of a particular architecture. I'm not, I'm not sure if those are in the in this repo. I think they should be. Um, but here's the the framework root. Pty should be terminal stuff. Project I'm going to guess is like um, classes for modeling a project, which is is not going to be so interesting. I think to us, graph is going to be graphy stuff. Docking sounds a bit UI related. See what docking is up to. Actions, D and D. That's presumably for, for playing Dungeons and Dragons, based on the dragon theme. Wizard. This is presumably if you're like a wizard in Dungeons and Dragons, and then things like widgets and utils. 
um, drag and drop. Oh, that was close. Um, okay, so this is this is kind of like UI stuff is, is how I'm gonna think of this. And then project, let's just take a quick look at um, how they model projects just to make sure that this is what it, what I believe it is. I guess this is not the right directory. Uh, maybe framework. Main, oh, so many directories. Uh, we have things like um, front end plugin. Let's look at the front end plugin because that will import some of the plugin stuff that'll that'll help us find out where the plugin stuff is. We have things like data panel dialogue. This is, um, I guessing, framework is maybe like this extensions of the the Spring framework. Maybe they, they maybe they just use framework to mean UI. The project just has a test directory. App has this merge plugin util stuff. Before when we looked in that stuff, it wasn't so fundamental. And then just util. We have this AWT. I think is some um, Java. UI stuff, Swing is definitely UI, docking. We took a quick look at the um, the docking stuff. We have plugin tool, util plugins. I was hoping that this would tell me where, yeah, let's go here, go to, go to plugin definition, framework plugin tool plugin. So plugin implements extension point, plugin, event listener, and service listener. This is a good comment, but it's all, it's like HTML and it's not being run, uh, like rendered by source graph. I don't know if it's rendered in GitHub, but maybe HTML isn't the way to go. Um, so plugins are a basic building block in Ghidra used to bundle features or capabilities into a unit that can be enabled or disabled by the user in their tool. Plugins expose their features and capabilities to users via menu items and buttons that the user can click on. Via service APIs and other plugins uh, can pro programmatically subscribe to and via plugin events that are broadcast. All right, so this is the this is the plugin entry point. Uh, it seems it's in framework slash plugin tool slash plugin .java. Plugin tool is kind of a, a funny name because um, it sounds like it's a that that's not where I would expect the main plugin. Um, like definitions to reside because it sounds like it's like some utilities for plugin. Okay, we've got a protected protected plugin tool that hosts slash contains this plugin. It's essentially a pointer to the plugin, I guess. Um, then we've got a name for the plugin, a description for the plugin, some list of um, I guess classes that extend plugin event. Okay, so you can produce some events, you can consume some events. And the way I guess that um, that plugins are going to communicate with the rest of the system is via some stream of events, and we've got some services. No, here. And <laughs> whether the constructor is finished, I guess you're not you're not typically supposed to do work in a constructor, but I feel like if you have constructor finished, then you're expecting constructors to do a lot of work. Um, you can register plugin implemented services, register static events, and do some cleanup that does things like remove the service listener, et cetera. And event sending process events. Okay. So this is all um, kind of like, if you think of the events as RPCs, it's kind of just like sending RPCs between the main program and the, um, and the plugin. So that's cool and all. Maybe let's take a look at plugin tool. It's, this is the base class that's a container to manage plugins and their actions and to coordinate the firing of plugin events and tool events. A plugin tool may have visible components supplied by component providers. These components may be docked within the tool or moved out into their own windows. Plugins normally add actions via Docking action, add action, docking action if. There is also an alternative method for getting actions to appear in the pop up context menu. See, add pop up action provider, pop up action provider. Okay, so use the docking stuff. We, we took a brief look at the docking directory. Use the docking stuff to, um, once you have a tool, if you want to add menu items, um, you use the docking, docking action st stuff. 
And I guess you might also have um, like contact, like right when you right click, there might be some context menu. And that's, I guess, this pop-up action provider. And the plugin tool extends abstract docking tool. We've got things like names. Um, it's got some, I guess, pointers to things like various managers, service managers, event managers, dialogue managers, property change support, et cetera. Okay. All of this is cool. Cool enough. Um, but let's find some analyzers. All right. Is emulation interesting? Generic? I don't know if generic is interesting. DB. I guess we might as well look at the DB a little bit. So emulation. I don't have a sense of what's going to be going on here. Um, well, maybe it's for like running the program in emulated mode. Emulator. Memory state. Adapted emulator. Do we get a readme? No. Emulator.java. They, um, to their credit, they have uh, pretty good comments. They, they have like consistently have top level comments for, for files. Here's the emulator interface. This interface may soon be deprecated. It has, was extracted from what it has now been renamed default emulator. Please consider using P code emulator instead. All right, I will, I will look at P code emulator then. Is that here? Here's default emulator. Let's see if we can find P code emulator. So it's in P code emu. Emu also doesn't have a readme. Does P code have a readme? No? Okay. So emu is different from emulate. I feel like they have to. They should uh, maybe like clean up the the naming and the readability just a little bit. But this, this thing has been um, kicking around since the early 2000s. So this is actually a super readable code base, all things considered. Okay, so P code emulator, um, a P code machine, which executes in concrete bytes and incorporates per architecture state modifiers. Okay, so per architecture presumably means that when you implement when you like add support for another architecture, maybe like um, a you know M four is that is that considered an architecture or like um, uh, I power PC or whatever? Um, you're going to implement some modifiers, presumably, and it's going to execute on concrete bytes. You it it sees some some list of bytes, I guess, which I'm going to think of as a as a Turing tape. And it's going to do architecture per architecture stuff. This is a this is a simple concrete bytes emulator suitable for unit testing and scripting. Okay, unit testing. I understand that that makes it sound like it's um, not uh, not the most amazing thing. If it, a lot of times things that are for testing are like are simplified, execute quickly, may not be the most uh, faithful emulators or whatever, and scripting. Um, Okay. More complex use cases likely benefit benefit by extending this to one, uh, by extending this or one of its super types. Okay, so uh, this is like the default implementation. You may need to um, do do more work. You may need to write your own like emulator class, I guess, that extends this. Likewise, the factory methods will likely instantiate classes which extend the default or one of its super types. And then it's got some advice for how to um, how to create an extension. The root object of an emulator is the p-code emulator, usually ascribed the type p-code machine. At the very least, we must know the language of the processor it emulates. It then derives appropriate arithmetic definitions, a shared memory state, and a shared user op library. Initially, the machine has no threads. For many use cases, creating a single p-code thread suffices. However, this default implementation models multi-threaded execution out of the box. Upon creation, each thread is assigned a local register state and a user op library for controlling that particular thread. Okay, so we've got some state. You need to create a thread. And we've got, I guess, the user op library controls the thread. The thread's full state and user op library are composed from the machine's shared components and the thread's particular components. For example, blah, 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 blah. All right, so uh, we're going to extend abstract p-code machine. I'm not sure what a p-code machine is. Maybe Wikipedia knows. 
a P-code machine. A portable code machine is a virtual machine designed to execute P-code, the assembly language or machine code of a machine code of a hypothetical central processing unit CPU. This term is applied both generically to all such machines, such as the Java virtual machine and MATLAB pre-compiled code, and to specific implementations, the most famous of which being the P machine of the Pascal P system, Pascal P system. Okay. All right, so there's some P code. I'm not sure what P code they're using, but some, uh, uh, some like portable uh, machine code. And I'm also not sure how that differs from the other. Um, I guess the other thing we saw was like a code for description, like slay the, the code for description of the processor itself. And this is like, I guess the code that runs on the processor. Um, and so this is just some, some, some class that has like bytecode p thread, bytecode p executor state, p code user op library. And we can look at each of these things and see what the default implementation is. Um, okay, so that, this is the, the implementation stuff is the stuff that's an exec. So this is like, we're gonna execute some p code. So the p code has a slay language which is good. We're starting to see how the two things relate. So if you're going to execute some P code, we need to know like what the underlying architecture is, I guess. We've got some arithmetic stuff, some state, whatever our reason is. Reasons for reading state. Okay. The, the, like the value is needed as the default program counter. The value is being read by the emulator as data in the course of execution. It's being decoded by the emulator as an instruction for execution, etc. Okay. So those are like, um, I guess for like logging and debugging and auditing mainly. And then we can construct an ex executor. All right, this is getting pretty interesting. Um, I would like to know what, what the P code is. P code, P code op raw, looks promising. It extends P code op, maybe let's look at P code op. These are the uh, opcodes of the P-code language. Does it tell us where it comes from? P-code op describes a generic machine operation. They may have just invented this themselves, this particular implementation. We've got things like copy, load, store, branch, call, um, int equal, returns true if operand equals operand two, left, right, floats, etc. Insert, extract, pop count. I'm not sure, I don't know enough about all this stuff to know like what the, um, you know, if there's like a minimal set of things you need to implement it to have a generic P code or, um, or all of that stuff. I'm sure that's relatively well known in the industry among people who, who build such things. Here's framework generic. I'm not sure why I opened this. This is probably not, um, the most interesting thing. Security key store password provider. It sounds like they're just using the standard Java um, key store stuff. There's architecture.java. Okay, so architecture is in Enum. It has things like x86, x86-64, PowerPC, PowerPC-64, ARM-64, and unknown. So I guess these are the default supported architectures. I'm not sure if this is extensible. Okay, cool. Shut down priority. What is shut down priority? First, dispose databases, dispose file handles. Yeah, okay, I don't know what that's for. Um, but let's look at the, the database just to see if there's anything that um, we would regret missing. B trees, nice. It's nice to see some B trees. We saw lots of B trees when we were looking at um, uh, the big standard databases. One thing they mentioned in this talk was that um, when they built this, they they built their own database because there at the time there is no um there is no uh good uh java database and um i thought that was i thought that was strange because, because it seems like it's it's much easier to use an existing database 
Um, I'm just out of curiosity now. Um, what is it? Hibernate? I think Hibernate is is a, is a Java database uh, like um, framework. Two thousand one. It's like an object relational ma mapping. There's some Java Java um, framework for okay. I think it's just like HDB whatever JDBC Java database connectivity. An API for that defines how a client may access a database. So I think if I remember, um, this will like let you connect to like MySQL and um, Postgres and all that stuff. And it says it was released first in 1997. So I feel like this predates Hedra. I'm not sure why they implemented their own databases with like B-tree nodes and stuff like that. But it seems like they could have just used um, my SQL or something. Maybe it was, maybe it predates SQLite. Initial release, August, 2000. I'm not sure. Maybe nowadays you'd use something like SQLite. At any rate, this seems to be like an actual database implementation with iterators and nodes and B trees and transactions. This is pretty wild. So I guess if you if you want to um, I'm not sure this you don't want to you, you don't want to implement your own database I think for the same reason you don't want to implement your own um, crypto because databases are um, difficult and complicated and easy to get wrong and not only are they easy to get wrong but the um, you know there, there are whole fields of people with database with with um, that have common knowledge of like how databases go awry. So it seems like this might be one a weak point of Ghidra. Like if you wanted to try to figure out how to like corrupt a Ghidra database in a certain way, you might be able to change what the view is on on whatever thing you're disassembling. I don't know if there's if, if there's anything worth looking into there, but that's kind of my my thought that that maybe they should migrate to like something like SQLite that has um, a, a few more eyes on it. And I saw um, Pavit had uh, messaged me. I have no, <laughs> I, um, I, I have no idea when you sent this. So sorry if I missed it. But um, hello. Okay. So um, all right. So I think I've seen a lot of the stuff I want to see. Except I haven't. I don't feel like I've really um, seen Slay. So let's see if we can find some Slay stuff. Here's some C++ under features decompiler source decompile CPP. And like what's going on in features? I don't know. We have the uh, file formats, function graph, new demangler. This is some of the stuff we saw in, in analyzers. We saw new demangler, um, graph services, Microsoft demang. Maybe features is analyzers, version tracking, system emulation, Source code lookup, um, recognizers, whatever PDB is. We'll just open some of these and see if they're, um, see if there's anything super cool going on inside of them. I think I already opened um, decompiler, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so back to the Slay search. Program breakpoint. Is in uh, plugin core debug service breakpoint. So I guess it's like a plugin implemented implemented as a plugin. We get some C plus um, plus P code parser in the feature slash decompiler. Slay base, more C plus plus stuff. Um, but do we have like a um, implementation of a of a Slay file? Is there a Slay? Does the search even work? Let's try. Okay. 
um, slay architecture. Let's see if we can find another entry point. <laughs> All right, there's some slaves. You can build a slay. Let's try. Is it the name of it? I forget what they called it. Um, decompiler. Okay. So Slay seems to be its, maybe its own project. Overview. Building Slay. We have lib SLA. P code emit. So maybe this P code is from Slay. Overview using Slay. Slay is a generic reverse engineering tool in the sense that the API is designed to be completely processor independent. In order to process binary executables for a specific processor, the library reads in a specification file, which describes how instructions are encoded and how they are interpreted by the processor. Okay. An application which needs to do this assembly or generate P code can design, can design to the Slay API once and then the application will automatically will automatically support any processor for which there's a specification. So SLA is the suff the suffix. Okay, let's try that. Okay, here we go. So they're under processors. So let's pick a processor, toy. Do we want toy? MIPS Dalvik, which should be, I guess, the Android processor. So I'm seeing more stuff in the chat. Um, this person whose name I can't, I can't read says, because of your streams, I get to know different tools and frameworks. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I like to, I um, appreciate hearing when, when people let me know that the streams are useful. Um, and I'm glad that's why, that's why I do these things. All right, let's, let's pick a, I don't know, 8048. Let's just look at an example slay file. Okay, XML. All right. And um, what is going on? I don't know. Source files. Uh, we have this SLA spec. Do I want SLA spec? This might be the more important thing. Atmel, toy, pick, Dalvik, 8048, arm. I don't know what any of these. I'm going to find something that sounds like it's simple. I don't think we name things after numbers anymore. So maybe this is an old enough processor to be simple. And so it's just going to include some other um, spec. At mail. Build dot gradle source. Huh. Let's have just a random one. We're just having like imports and defines. I want to see like a real. This looks good. I'm guessing there's no slay mode. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I'm not going to get syntax highlighting, although let's just see if, if, um, If you like star dot slay spec, I wonder if this will do syntax highlighting. Oh, I think I have to do this as a, like a real regular expression. Okay, there we go. Um, well, it's not gonna do highlighting either, but whatever. Okay, so back to Emacs. So we have things like define token bit op type, bit op type. I guess some sort of um, op uh, op code, zero page indirect, absolute indexed indirect, some instructions, 
and I, the variables are unreadable, um, but we get these code blocks. We have things like local temp C, uh, I guess it's like assigning to a temp variable, result flags. And this should be like stuff about um, the various uh, registers, right? And like how things move when you do, I mean, maybe that's really what it is. You have some list of registers and you describe um, uh, what's the word like a Markov model. Essentially you, you have some, you have some state like just like a, like a state machine, right? You have some, you, you have some state, um, which are the registers and you have um, each of the like opcodes should do like transformations on the registers. And, and so is that how things are encoded? Maybe. Let's try looking at, um, So I'm just going to guess that that's more or less what's going on. Let's look at x86. Yeah. Okay. Let's try x86.sla. Is that a thing? Yes. It's really large. Yeah. I'm not sure. We have like user op, RD seed. RD seed is valid. Is RD seed a thing? RD rand, I recognize. So RD Rand is an instruction for returning random numbers. So let's take a look at RD Rand. So RD Rand dot sync index sixteen. I don't know what that means. Um, let's do a cur RD Rand. Oops. And. We have this is the ID. I don't know if we can verify if this is the the correct like um, number for for RD Rand seven four eight eight whatever um, print piece RD Rand. I'm not sure. I guess that's for printing stuff, and then. We have this thing with some index and uh, and whatnot. Okay, what if we just do grab for RD Rand in this? Uh, in here, then we see um, with this sync file. Is this more interesting? Yeah. So I'm not sure what the syntax is. I mean, you can go into, into um, I'm sure you can do a deep dive in this lay, but we, at least here in this sync file, we see things like P codes and operands together in the same file <laughs> for the first time. Um, and I'm guessing that, that really what's going on is it's, um, it's, somehow modeling the, the state machine with some sort of syntax. And in fact, I'm going to ask if one of these uh, chat GPT or Bard, I've been liking Bard more lately. Um, do you know about the Slay B compiler? Yes, I'm familiar with the Slay decompiler. Okay. It's part of the Ghidra reverse engineering platform. I don't know if that's true. It seems like it might be a separate thing. I'm not sure if the NSA developed it or, or whatever. Um, at first, works by first disassembling the code into a low-level intermediate representation called register transfer logic uh, language. It's then decompiled into high-level code in a language such as C or C++. It's a powerful decompiler that produces high quality results. Um, so what, what do I need in order to implement a Slay, um, I'll just say Slay support for my brand new processor that I designed.
you'll have to write a slight language definition for your processor. You'll specify the instruction set, architecture, ISA of your processor, including the opcodes, operands, and registers. Okay, so this is the stuff that I was talking about. We've got registers, which, which is the state, the opcodes, um, which are essentially just the codes, right? Let's see what the official definition of opcode is. Yeah, it's, it's just the code. Is the portion of machine instru language instruction that specifies the operation to be performed. It's like a function name, right? Um, and a, but a, from a set of known functions. And then the operand is the thing that's passed to it, right? I feel like you need an implementation of what the opcode does, right? Write a register transfer language decoder. This decoder will translate the machine code instructions of your processor into Slay RTL instructions. Okay, so there's, there's like a target RTL language. There's, there's this target generic RTL language, and your job as a language provider is you've got um, some model of things, and you say how to, to produce the primitives of the RTL. Then you write a, a high-level language decompiler. I'm not sure that you have to do three. Let's just double check Bard here. Are you sure I have to write a? I would have thought that was done already since I've produced um, RTL with my decoder. Okay, so I don't have to, uh, okay. Once I've written a Slay register transfer language, I can use the existing Slay HL de decompiler. I might want to write my own. It's not, <laughs> the existing one's not perfect. It might not be able to decompile all RTL instructions correctly. This, um, this seems like bad advice. I'm going to assume that that, I'm sure no, nothing is perfect, but, but I assume that the idea is that I just write in one direction and it does the reverse direction on its own. Okay, and so I, I have no concept of what the appropriate syntax is supposed to be, but conceptually that, that's what's going on. So here are a bunch of sync files. I'm gonna close this. Pcode parse is going to be a parser. Um, here's some lexing stuff. Lexing state, special two, special three, two, second character of a special three character operator. Okay, I guess we don't, I guess there's not more than three characters to an operator. Um, star token, advanced token, standard lexing stuff. Why is it in C? Because I thought we saw some lexing stuff in Java. But, um, but, okay. So, but it's, you know, that a similar thing in C, I guess. Or maybe the, the, the parsing stuff we saw was for something else. Here's Gidra Arch. Gitter process. Let's look at Gitter process. Registration point and dispatcher for commands sent to the decompiler. What else do we have? Address. Some some of the similar stuff that we saw in Java. So we've got mo some model of an address, a low-level machine address for labeling bytes and data. Block action call graph, cast code data. Yeah, I don't know. Um, File manage, float, Gidra context, Gidra process, Gidra arch. Let's get Gidra arch dot hh. Gidra specific architecture information in connection to a Gidra client. Exception that mirrors exceptions from the thrown by the Gidra client. So maybe this is like the server side stuff. Implementation of the architecture interface and connection to a Gidra client in order to manage the major pieces of the architecture, load image, translate, database, type factory, etc. This class manages a communication channel between the compiler and a Gidra client for a single executable. So um, one of the things that they mentioned in the talk is that they wanted they wanted scale, they wanted to be able to support multiple people decompiling different parts of the same binary. So there, this seems to be like some, some client server stuff that that's possibly in here for, um, for scaling. 
What is a comment? Is this like a code comment? A comment attached to a specific function in code address. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I will ask, um, let's try chat GPT this time. So in the uh, Ghidra code base, what's the difference between the, uh, decompiler written in C++ and the, de and, um, compiler functions written in Java. So the, um, ChatGPT is saying that Ghidra's decompiler is primarily written in C++, while the user interface of various other components are written in Java. So I guess the Java stuff maybe just needs to parse um, enough to understand the UI, and that the, the core decompiler is really this C++ stuff. While the core decompiler logic is written in C++, Ghidra provides a Java-based user interface that allows users to interact and utilize the decompiler functionality. Okay, so um, I guess CPP is where you want to be if you want to understand all of the um, the nitty-gritty of how things are are, are decompiled. Um, however, from looking at the the Java side. I think we we have like a fairly good model of what the C++ compiler is doing, even if we haven't seen the, the code directly. Um, that being said, I will just like look at um, some of these and see if there's anything um, that's, that's super important. This is a thing that wraps a Unix domain socket. This is interface.hh. I'm not sure what interface means here. Um, an exception thrown during the execution of command, I face execution. I face command, a command that can be executed from the command line. Okay. So maybe interface means like the command line interface address action. Well, let's see what action is. A list of groups defining a root action. What kind of actions do we have? Apply a rule repeatedly until no changes. Apply a rule once per function, uh, print debug message specifically for his actions. Okay. So this is like different like strategies, I guess. Call graph. And this is just going to be some graph structure that they're going to populate as they, I guess, decompile stuff. Capability cover. I don't know what cover is. Database. Dynamic. What is dynamic? An edge between a var node and a p code op. A dynamic hash. Dynamic hash is defined as a subgraph of the data flow. And this defines an edge in the subgraph. So, uh, utilities for making references to dynamic variables. Okay. So the, in the, in Java, uh, the, the top level comments are like below some of the include stuff. And, uh, here they're right up with the, um, the copyright statement. So I got confused for a second. All right. But most of this looks like fairly straightforward. Um, if we had another hour, I might look uh, more at this stuff, but I think even, um, we've seen enough of this, the slay stuff and the Java stuff that a lot of this should be straightforward. I will look at raw arc. I will look at slay, which I think I haven't looked at yet, but it may have opened slay example. I definitely want to see, um, slay parse, slay pattern, maybe. Oh, psi pattern. Oh, slay with no vowels. Um, slay symbol. Yep. I'll look at the slay stuff. Transform. I'll look at transform. Union resolve. I don't know if that's like similar to union find. We have some XML. That HH, I guess it's probably for parsing XML. Here's raw arch. Raw binary architecture capability. So the top level thing says bare bones capability for treating a file as a raw executable image. And, uh, there's really not much here. Build loader, resolve architecture. Okay. Uh, here's slay.hh classes and utilities for the main slay engine. And do we get symbols? Yeah, we get symbols. So we have a disassembly cache, a P code cacher. So we're going to cache things as we disassemble them. That makes sense. We've got some P code data, relative record, which is the thing here. Uh, 
for describing a relative P code branch destination. An intra instruction P code branch takes a relative operand. The actual value produced during P code generation is calculated at the last second using this. Okay, so we're doing branching. Um, okay. P code cacher, P code data, slave builder. Let's look at this. The class slay, a full slay engine, it's provided with a load image of the bytes to be disassembled and context database. Assembly is produced via the print assembly command. P code is produced via the one instruction method. Okay, so we've got an image loader, the mapped, which has the mapped bytes of the program, a database. I don't know if this is the same database that we saw in Java, and some, some caches. Um, you can get a parse context and we can resolve things, um, generate a parse tree suitable for disassembly, prepare the parse tree for P code generation. And then we have some constructor, register context, etc. And a big comment for documentation, I guess. And then maybe let's take a look at the implementation. I think they call it C or do they call it CC? Uh, I see some parsing state. I see parsing context stuff. And let's see what it imports actually, including slay HH and uh, load image. I don't know where we like really read the SLA file. Disassembly cache. Get parser context. Yeah, I'm not sure. This seems to be, oh, here we go. The .sla file from the document store is loaded and cache objects are prepared. So we're gonna call slay, uh, so this is the implementation, I guess, of slay initialize with a document storage thingamajig. And the, the document storage thing is going to contain the SLA file. We check if it's initialized. And if not, I guess we throw some sort of error. Um, and we register context, set up the cache size and window size. And then we um, create a new disassembly cache. And that's it. That's all we do in reinitialize. And then to obtain a context, we look in the cache and get the parser context, et cetera. Resolve resolves all the, uh, resolve all the constructors involved in the instruction at the indicated address. So, um, we have some, the, some, some parser context. Um, which is the position, and we're going to get the buffer at the position and get the address and load it into the loader. And we have some parser walker change. That's really going to walk stuff and change stuff. Um, clear the previous result and initialize the walker. We have some constructor stuff. Um, computing some offsets, loading context for resolving the walker. Uh, set the constructor. I don't know what this is doing. <laughs> Apply context. And then I guess while Walker is state, this is presumably just like walking along the parse graph or something like that. The SLA thingy. Um, we're going to get operands. Somehow the Walker knows about operands. And while, um, we have operands left, we're going to call CT get operand on the opper. I don't know where CT came from. Hmm. No. Is CT passed in? It's like declared here. We're going to set the constructor. Well, CT is, is a constructor, whatever a constructor is. Um, it seems like the constructor is somehow knows about the operands and stuff like that. Let's look at what constructor is doing.
This is not a symbol. So the constructor has things like token patterns, subtable symbols, pattern equations. And so I guess this is just stuff you get from parsing. So there's essentially maybe some sort of like table that's going to look up symbols based on, on the table of, of what we had in them. All right. So that's a, that's like a quick view of what slay the slay class is up to here's slay base, which I don't think you look at a class for recording source file information Here's the base class for process, um, that process slay format specifications. And we have things like find symbol, find global symbol. So these are presumably red. Um, the symbols, I guess, come from the program, right? So as you're parsing the program, they, they fill up with the, with the, the parser. Was an indexer? I don't know. Source file index used when generating slay constructor debug info. Okay. Num sections should be the number of named sections. Um, what else do we have? So we have a root decoding symbol. I guess that's like an entry point um, in slay. We have a symbol table. Some maximum number of bytes. You can read the, spe the slay specification from XML. And we can get things like the get register names, user op names, find symbol, et cetera. This is all like, um, I guess like parsing files and parsing programs and populating this stuff. And then we saw some um, execution engine in Java. I'm not sure if there's also um, a corresponding execution engine in C++. Slay pattern, uh, we don't get a top level comment up here, but we have some stuff down here like um, a pattern block mask value pair viewed as two bit streams. So I guess this is, I don't know. I don't know what a pattern is. I know what a block is. Instruction pattern matches the instruction bit stream. So I guess this is some stream of instructions, a pattern with no ors in it. Okay. So I guess this is kind of like a, a code block, a, a group of instructions. And, um, this is happening and it sure is. And I guess pattern block feels a little bit like a code block, um, but I'm not sure. Something about masking and values, um, but we have things like instructions and things that don't have ors, whatever our context bitstream is. And what else? You can restore XML, okay. We can find out, uh, here's the pattern class. You can shift an instruction, do or do and common sub pattern. So maybe the, um, this might be closer to the log the logical representation of, um, you know, eventually when you get down to like processor level, it's all, um, like transistors, right? I don't know if we're like closer to the, to the, uh, to the level of the, uh, of the processor here. And so maybe, um, maybe patterns are like kind of patterns in the logical language. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm going to read this as a Z, I guess. Zobu Don Kali is saying, is it possible to explore make or IBM the toolkit by make, do you mean GNU make? And I don't know what IBM the toolkit is. Uh, but maybe. Is this it? The IBM integration toolkit? Yeah, either of those is fine. If you, um, why don't you leave a, can you leave a comment on, uh, maybe this video or, or some other video? Uh, that way I'll have it, uh, recorded for posterity and I can, I can make sure that I, um, that I write it down on my list. Um, okay, so I'm not sure I figured out what a what a slay pattern is, but a slay symbol seems like it's probably a, a symbol. And we have types of symbols, things like tokens, user op, value symbols, value map symbols, names, uh, nodes, start symbols. Okay, so these are just implementation of various kinds of symbols. And transform. I'm going to try to... Uh, I think kind of sprint a little bit more to the end now since we've been here for um, like an hour and 35 minutes.
Okay, um, so we have classes for building large scale transforms for function data flow. Large scale transforms of function data flow. So we've presumably, um, if we're using this class, we have some model of the how the data is flowing between the functions. And we're gonna transform the, like, is this the same as the call graph? I don't know, but let's take a look at what they do. Now we have vector lane sizes, marshaling attribute, vector lane sizes. We have placeholder node for var node that will exist after the transform is applied to a function. So after the transform, um, there will be some some new node, I guess. And this is a, a, a placeholder for it. Transform var. We've got a transform manager. So we've got a manager in operation. The manager presumably manages the operations. And uh, types of replacement var nodes. A piece of an original var node, uh, something that a var node pre-existed in the original data flow, a new temporary unique space var node, and et cetera, et cetera. Brief flags for a transform var. Split terminator, input duplicate. I'm not sure uh, what a var node is here. I've seen it. Before. I've seen it elsewhere in the, in the code base. I'm guessing it's not a general per a general thing. It's some kind of node. Let me see if there's the internet knows about var nodes in general, or if it's here you go, Ghidra. For all as possible var node, just a variable location and size, not part of a syntax tree. So it's a very it's a location and size. A raw var node is said to be free. It is not attached to any variable. So it's just a location and a size. What other var nodes do we have? Var node AST. This type of var node is a node in the abstract syntax tree. But what does var what does var mean? Okay, so the the two known the direct known subclasses are the AST node. It's a node in the abstract syntax tree, or it's some operation, I guess. And an operation is is it's got an op code and it's some in some list of input values so you've got an op code and then like the base var node is is what like a location and a size so we know where it is and how big it is and so we can read the input we can read the inputs by just like reading them off the turing tape and applying the op code to it so that's a that's what i'm going to think of a, a var node operation as and then um a node in the abstract syntax tree I guess, um, and, and a Varnode AST has, a, has an address, size, and an identifier. And just recursively, um, I, I guess it has to be another Varnode. So it has like an operand or some argument to the operand essentially. All right, and so we can transform this thing, which I'm going to think of as basically just transforming, the, just transforming the AST. I'm not sure why you would transform like the arguments to an opcode, uh, unless you can maybe prove that the opcode doesn't need one of the arguments or, or something like that. Um, and so that seems to be what this sort of thing is doing. You can have a piece of the original var node, so maybe like a piece of the AST, like a subtree. New temporary var node, temporary representing. Okay. Encoding a P code op reference. And let's see if we can find some some type some example transformations. Lane description. I don't know what lanes are. Let's go to lane description. Describes a register storage location and the ways it may be split into lanes. All right. So I guess a lane is um some subset of uh, registers. So a laned register. Hmm. So, and then we have a description of uh, laned, logical lanes within a big var node. A lane, here we go, here's the definition. A lane is a byte offset and size within a var node. Okay, so we have some, so we have some var node, and um, we might have a byte offset into it. 
and the size. So it's basically like a chunk of a, of a Varnode. Lanes within a Varnode are disjoint. So I guess lanes define like a partition of the Varnode. Um, so if you're going to partition something, you can use that for like parallelism, I guess. So I, I'm not sure um, why we're chunking things off, but I guess we can. In general, we expect the Varnode to be tiled, tiled with lanes of all the same size. So this is, uh, <laughs> so it's kind of like cosets of a group. They're all, um, they're all the same size. They're like kind of like the same size chunks, but the a API allows us for possibly non-uniform lanes. We have the whole size, the lane size and lane position. And then here, transform, transform manager, which should be the manager is a class for splitting larger registers holding smaller logical lanes. So if, if we've got a large register, um, that register might be composed of sub things. Those sub things are, are maybe called, maybe what lanes are supposed to be. Given a starting var node in the data flow, look for evidence of the var node being interpreted as disjoint logical values concatenated together. Okay. I'm wondering if these are like concepts that are like um, similar across different architectures that, that reappear. And so what they're doing is like, um, you know, maybe the, maybe a large register, like let's say you have uh, like a 32 bit register. Um, I think that one of the things that happened as we switched to 64 bits is like um, the, maybe some of the 64 bit thingies registers were really 232 bit registers. And so maybe um, those, those 232 bit things are what they're thinking of as lanes. And maybe that happens um, uh, multiple different ways in different architectures. Uh, that's going to be my work, <laughs> my working theory. Um, so being interpreted as disjoint logical values concatenated together, lanes, if the interpretation is consistent for data flow involving the var nodes, split the var node and data flow into explicit operations on the lanes. And so if my theory is correct, then um, it's saying like, let's track those two 32 bit things um, separately. And so let's ask, I guess let's ask uh, Bard, if this is true. Um, we're, let's do, let's do a quick search first. So for what size are EAX, AX, H, and the counterparts in 64 bits? So EAX is 32 bits, AX is 16 bits. These others are eight bits. With the old names, all registers remain the same size, just like when x86.16 was extended to x86.32. To access 64-bit integer registers, you need to use the new names with R prefix, such as racks. Okay, so let's look up racks. It's a mountain range in the Northern Limestone Alps. All right, there must be, yeah, 64-bit register. Okay. Starting with the AMD Opteron, um, the x86 architecture extended the 32-bit registers into 64-bit registers in a way similar to how the 16 to 32-bit extension took place, which I was unaware was a thing, but I guess it's a thing. An R prefix for register identifies the 64-bit registers, racks, etc. And eight additional 64-bit registers, R8 to R15, were also introduced in the creation of x86-64. Okay, so I think that this is what a lane is in Ghidra. Let's see if we can find um, anything uh, to confirm or deny this. I'll say in Ghidra, what is a lane? A portion of the graphical user interface GUI that explain, that displays specific information. This is not right. It's very barred. And why don't we try x86, what is it, 64 lane? Maybe lane is a general thing. I doubt it.
a vertical column in the code window. Well, maybe those are called lanes. I don't know, but I I think I think what's going on is that lanes are basically like the sub registers that that were cobbled together into larger registers, um, and they're splitting things up, and that is probably a big part of what the this transform stuff does. They're just taking like racks and splitting it up into the, whatever the two sides of racks are. Union resolvable? I don't know. A data type resolved from an associated type union or type struct. Okay, so we have some type union um, and it's figuring out, I guess, the actual data type. Parent refers to either a union, a structure that is an effective union, one field filling the entire structure or a pointer to a union structure. The object represents a data type that is resolved via analysis from the parent data type. Resolved data type can be either a specific field in the parent, if the parent is not a pointer, a pointer to a specific field, or the parent data type itself. Okay. So, analyze data flow to resolve which field of a union data type is being accessed. And we do this with var nodes. A var node with a data type that is either a union, a pointer to blah, 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 blah. How do we figure it out? I'm not sure. Trial. Construct a downward trial for a var node. Construct an upnode trial. So I guess we just try things. A mark accumulated when a given var node is visited within a specific field index. Okay, so we've got some union and we're trying to figure out what is being populated. And that's what's going on there. Slate.hh, I've already looked at. Here's the Ghidra features directory. Um, we've looked at decompiler. Uh, let's see, did we open? I think we open a few of these. So let's, let's look at GNU demangler. When I saw GNU demangler, um, my first thought was like maybe this was just some existing thing that they imported. But it looks like maybe they maybe they uh, wrote it. Core analysis. So like they call them analyzers, but I'm wondering if like there's just a billion um, like core analysis folders that all have the same like features folder as opposed to like a single analysis folder that has all the analyzers. Um, okay, so a version of the demangler analyzer to handle GNU GCC symbols. Symbols. Okay, so this seems to be this seems like something they they implemented themselves. It's like a copyright statement, right? The IP is owned by Ghidra. All right, so this is going to have um, things like option name, apply calling convention. And this is, uh, I guess I'm not going to like dig into this, but um, presumably you get something like this by closely looking at all the things that uh, the, the GCC compiler can do and, um, and just <laughs> like having a table where you can kind of like look up um, look up how to do it. So mangling should be, um, so like mangling I know happens in things like GC, uh, G, uh, C++ where um, you like mangle the function names to do, I think like overloading is what, what it's for. And then um, you want to demangle them so that the names are, are more human readable. So let's see if you can find it. Um, an example of what a mangled name looks like. Although name mangling is not generally required or used by languages that do not support function overloading. Yeah, so I guess it is overloading. Like C and Classic Pascal, they use it in some cases. But C++ is, I think, what I'm more familiar with. You have like a function F, it becomes like underscore, underscore F, underscore V. Where the V comes from, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe void. And then F underscore underscore F underscore I for the inversion or something like that. Okay, so you want to take symbols like this, which are mangled, and, and produce symbols like this, which are demangled, I guess, is what this class is implementing. Version tracking. I was just curious what is going on with version tracking, because they mentioned this is one of the features. It makes it sound like just having a Git repo. <laughs> Not sure uh, what is going on. Version tracking script. It is a JavaScript. I mean, well, it's a script in Java. It's not like JavaScript, the, the language. Uh, version tracking script. We have a VT session, transaction ID, 
create version tracking session. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what they're um, referring to as version tracking. Let's see if we can look it up. Version tracking refers to the process used by reverse engineers to identify matching code or data between different software binaries. I think maybe binaries from the same project. So maybe this is like, I've disassembled, um, let's say Postgres, because I have Postgres on my mind. I've disassembled Postgres version 14.9, and then 15.0 comes out, and I want to reuse the work I've done for 14.9, and I think that's what this is about. One common use case is to version track two different versions of the same binary. Okay, there we go. Alternatively, version tracking techniques can be used to check for the presence of a particular piece of code within a given binary of interest. This is for like, um, you could use this for example, to see if, if, you, if you have like a popular uh, GPL project and you think that um, some maybe some closed source people are including your, your code, but not, um, abiding by the, by the rules of the GPL. Maybe you can use version tracking to, to see if like there's some snippet of your code that is locatable in the, in the binary or something like that. So version tracking is, I think probably a little bit interesting, but, um, not so interesting that I'm going to dig into it even more. System emulation should just, should be emulators. We've seen a little bit of it. Um, but I'm not going to go into it anymore right now. First code lookup. I'm not sure what this means. Is this just looking it up in the database? This is like plugin stuff. Source code lookup. Extends program manager. Go to simple source. Okay, so go to simple source. Um, this should, this seems a little bit like find references. Source code lookup. Uh, docking action. Action perform lookup symbol. Let's see lookup symbol. It's going to get some symbol text, attempt to demangle it, get the Eclipse integration service, and I guess probably just use Eclipse to, to find the symbol. Okay. And then recognizer. I don't know what a recognizer is. Ace recognizer, BZIP2 recognizer. Okay. So this is, I guess, trying to recognize, I don't know if these are recognizing the, the file formats or something else. RPM, RAR. Let's pick one that we think is mildly fun. I guess. Deb, is Deb mildly fun? The Deb recognizer has, there's some minimum level of bytes. And I guess this, this is, some like magic file stuff that appears at the, at the header of a Debian file. And that's, that's what we check. Now let's try gzip. Okay. So it seems like we're just like reading the first few bytes of a file. How many bytes does a recognizer need to recognize its format? Yeah, okay. I feel like this could be a single file instead of uh, 8 billion different recognizers. Okay, so here's PBD. I have no idea what PBD is. Uh, I'm just mainly curious what it stands for, but let's see if we can find anything about it. PBD. PBD utils. PB, P, oh, PDB must be a debugger, right? Something debugger. PBD identifiers from the specified file. Yeah, but what debugger is it? Perl? Python debugger. Okay, that makes sense. I guess they maybe have integrated Python debugger for um, the Python scripting support. Here's Ghidra's server. Test.slow. Uh, we have database in Ghidra. This should be just some Java server, I would guess. Repository, command watcher, stream, store, security, remote.
manages a version local file system instead of users and permissions. But where's the actual server? Server admin, user manager, stream, block stream server. Block stream server provides a block stream server implementation intended for integration with the RMI Ghidra server implementation. The default instance will obtain its port from the server factory. Okay, so this is going to serve some block streams. We've got SSL server socket stuff. Um, so this seems to be the server. And Russell Waite is saying, isn't PDB the Windows debugger format? It could be. Program database? Yeah. Program database is a file format for storing debugging information about a program. Oh, okay. That, that probably is what it is then. Um, let me get rid of this stuff. I'm guessing it's more likely to be that than, than Python program database. Thank you. I was unaware of that. Okay, so here's the server. This should just be some, some standard Java server. Provides the main Ghidra server application and implements Ghidra server handler, which facilitates remote access to services provided by a repository manager. The single instance of Ghidra server is set within the RMI registry, which is accessible on a user-specified port. I don't know what the RMI registry is. Is this like a Java framework thing? The remote method where to go? Invocation registry is essentially a directory service. So it's some directory service. You can ask it for, I guess, probably services that are running. And no, no login. Okay, so it's it's a it's a server. I'm curious what the handlers are. Do we maybe over here we see handlers? Like I want to know what the API is. We have the we have the block stream server, which is serving some sort of block stream. Um, name lookup repository handle implementation repository server handle server help server port factory. I'm not sure. Store stream remote repository repository maybe. File system listener. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't see. Uh, add handle, add a user handle to this repository. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what it's serving. Maybe the Ghidra documentation will tell us what the API is. Uh, Ghidra can support multiple users working together on a single project. Individual Ghidra users launch and work on their own local copies of a particular Ghidra project. The check changes into a common repository containing all commits to that repository. So it doesn't seem like you're... Um, so I don't think it's like a server necessarily in the sense that um, the decompiler is running on some like mainframe in a big room. Like if you need to decompile a gigantic thing, I think you need to have all of the um, all the horsepower for decompilation on your individual workstation that you're working on, and then it sounds like it's mainly the um, the the changes the the results of the decompilation that are sent back to a central repo, repo. So it's kind of like working on a common file system. It sounds like, but I'm not sure. Um, here's the function ID features. I'm not sure if this is 
interesting, but let's check it out. We have an analyzer, which I'm going to guess is the analyzer, function ID analyzer. I guess let's look at, um, at, at an analyzer and then we'll look at abstract analyzer. And I think that'll be basically be it. And I'll, I'll take a quick look at the remaining tabs, but I'm guessing, um, that, that they're not going to contain anything super groundbreaking. Okay. So this is the function ID analyzer. We're going to extend abstract analyzer. We've got some function ID service. We can create analysis bookmarks, etc. Old option names and old option names. So here's the constructor, I guess. FID is listed as a byte analyzer because we don't want to run it all the time. I don't know why being a byte analyzer means it's not run all the time. It wants to look at as much of the surrounding code, call tree really, as it can, which means it's expensive. It can't be run every time a new function is created. On the other hand, it's important to identify some types of common functions by their name, exception handlers, for instance, and other non-exiting functions. So FID should be run as soon as possible after most of the function bodies are discovered. FID re relies on proper function bodies existing. So I guess what's, what this is saying is that like, first you do most of the work and then the FID analyzer runs as opposed to like running on the fly as you're decompiling or whatever, whatever the first processing step is called. Um, can analyze, okay, I guess we just check whether we can process it. Add, added in the past tense, which takes a program name, address set view, task monitor, a message log, and there's an exemption. And check if it's fully executable. We have some command that's, that's apply FID entries command. And I'm not sure. I'm going to take a score threshold, a multi-score threshold. Let's go to score threshold. Okay. It's just not, um, that's just the, like the declaration the is fully executable checks. If it contains the full executable or loaded slash initialized memory error. So it might be like some chunk of an executable register options. I guess you give it some options in a program and it registers them somewhere. You can say that options have changed, but what is it? What does it do? So added seems to be doing the main stuff, right? FID analyzer, get default name options changed. Okay. So where is this class? Okay. It's implemented not in the analyzer, but in like the feature directory. The apply FID entries command extends a background command. So it's something that presumably that runs in the background. Um, and what does it do? Apply to, you give it a domain object and a task monitor. Presumably the task monitor is going to monitor the background, uh, service thingy, the background command. Uh, we're going to get the, or create a new FID service. And if the object we're being handed is a, is a program, then we do some programming stuff. Like, um, we get the, uh, FID query service from the program language and we tell them, I guess we send the monitor some messages. So it knows we're making progress. Like we send the message FID analysis and maybe that goes in a log somewhere and we call service process program with the find with the FID query service and a score threshold in the monitor. And if we. If the process program returns null, we, we return false. And otherwise we have a bunch of surfed results from the process program thing. And we check whether we've been canceled, I guess, cause we're doing work in a loop and we don't want to keep doing it if we're, we've been told to stop and we increment progress every time we go through an entry. And if the thunk we continue, I guess we're not interested in thunks. And if the entry is empty. So if the, um, if the number of, if the matches in the entry is non empty, then we process the matches. Otherwise we send some no results method and then we, whatever apply conflict labels is doing. Let's go look at process matches. We get some search results. Um, and 
calls we call name analysis analyze names on the matches uh whatever get most optimistic count is we analyze libraries from the matches because the matches can have things like names and libraries and if we find if the name analysis ugh, stop that um num names is one if all names are the same up to a difference in the underscore prefix then we see that we found a single match i guess otherwise we see that we have multiple matches okay and then what was this function um up here process program uh FID service. So we will keep chasing. Seems, seems like some of the implementation is in the FID service. See if we can find process program here. Process program. Searches the database to find results of our program. <laughs> this is just some database search function that's been like um, turned out into like a, a service and an analyzer and a bunch of other things. Okay, so really it's, it's like looking in the database for stuff. I guess, um, uh, to, to see if it finds like the name or whatever. So that's the, at least a flavor of what, um, what this, um, analyzer is doing. I would like to go back to, uh, take a look at the app, the, like app, the analyzer interface, or maybe it's an abstract class instead of an interface. No, I want the interface. Okay, so an analyzer can do what? It can, it can, it's an extension point. So you can, I guess, extend it. You can get its name, uh, you can get analysis type, whether it's enabled by default. Supports one-time analysis. Returns true if it makes sense for this analyzer to direct, to be directly invoked on an address or address set. The auto analyzer plugin will automatically create an action for each analyzer that returns true. You can get a description. Um, you return true if we can analyze this particular program added here's the added thing called when the requested information type has been added for example when a function is added called when the requested information type has been added okay so this is this like a callback so like we with the analyzer calls it when, when the information is available i'm not sure called when the requested information type has been removed for example when a function is removed I guess maybe, yeah, I'm not sure. Who, I'm not sure, sure who calls it, but whatever. Um, options changed, analysis ended, etc. Okay, that's a relatively small interface. Uh, and then here's the abstract class. We can do things like set priority, set prototype. Whether it, whether it's a prototype, I don't know if that means like it's in beta or if it's like a prototype in some other technical sense. And then we have things like removed and added. Let's see if we can find who calls removed. I don't, I see lots of comments. I see um, uh, removed being assigned to, I see what seem to be implementations of removed. But I don't see anyone calling it yet. Um, all right, well, I guess I made a good faith effort <laughs> to find it. Okay, um, so here's decompiler. We already looked at this. Byte patterns. Um, I'm going to guess this is m m kind of more of the same, but I guess let's just... Wait, is it byte patterns or bit patterns? Here's bit patterns. Here's byte patterns. Closed pattern mining. Face. What is face? A face extends didded bit sequence. Typically represents the number of data points this face contains. What is a face? I don't know. Finds the joint of two faces, the smallest face that contains both F1 and F2. It sounds like a uh, a geometrical thing. 
Yeah, sure. Who knows? Here's the analyzer implementation. We have a func database, a func record patterns. We got patterns. We have pattern constraints.xml. So we have some constraint on patterns. We have a pattern, a program decision tree. Uh, what are we deciding though? Get pattern decision tree. We have pattern directories, decision tree. Hmm. Find any pattern files associated with this program. I feel like I want to know what key patterns are. Search instruction patterns. This dialogue, dialogue allows users to search the current program for specific instruction sequences. Operands and mnemonics may be masked to allow maximum flexibility for modifying the search criteria. The search dialog consists of two components. I think this, this seems like it's for, um, if you know what you're looking for, checking if the, uh, if the binary contains some of those things you're looking for. Let's ask chat GPT. And in fact, maybe we can look on um, here, analysis, in my stack is auto analyzed. Do I get, um, do I get to choose specific analyzers. See if patterns is in here. Uh, I don't see it. Is it under, is there something under tools? Select program changes, subroutine. Dead subroutines, program highlight, instructions, search, add matching instructions for instruction patterns. I don't know what any of this stuff does. Select instructions from the listing and then populate it. Okay. I don't know what counts as an instruction. Well, I think I've selected a thing. So what do I do now? Where's reload? Are these the instructions? Let's try that. Okay, and so it tells me where where those instructions appear. What if I just do search for um, push? Does that count as a pattern? What if I do push RBP? I guess if I highlight it, it seems to highlight all the stuff. All right, at any rate, we can search for some stuff. All right. In the context, oh, wait, this is key, this is lanes. Didn't I ask about patterns too? Does not have a pattern analyzer. Um, okay, that's fine. Let's close a bunch of stuff. This is software modeling stuff, which we don't need. This is the var node stuff, which we don't need. This is what the instruction patterns thing, which I'm done with. Whatever patterns are, they seem to be some subset of, um, and like searching for instructions. I assume since it's called patterns that you can maybe do something like regex if you really tried to figure it out. And then features base, which I'm just going to ignore because it's just going to be some generic stuff that we've seen, I think, a few implementations of already. One thing I thought I saw um, yesterday was um, something like machine learning. Extensions, machine learning. Yeah, function finding. 
So we have things like random forests, random forest function finder plugin. That's fun to say. Random forest function finder plugin. A program plugin for training a model on the start of known functions in a program and then using that model to look for more functions in the source program or another program selected by the user. Okay. So you train on the starts of known functions in a program. And then um, I don't know if that means like you have the source code of some program and you're you're training it on the on the generated uh, like machine code, the, the compiled thing, and then you use that as the training data. I'm not sure. This map is used to close all providers associated with programs. So what are they using for machine learning though? Tribuo, is that machine learning thing? All this seems to be Ghidra stuff. Machine learning. Let's find out what Tribuo is. Machine learning in Java. Huh. Okay. They've got like AI slash machine learning stuff built in. So how about Ghidra random, uh, whoops. Let's try Ghidra Random Forest. No TLS certificate. An optional machine learning extension has been added containing the Random Forest Function Finder plugin. The plugin finds undiscovered functions within it. <laughs> sounds like it's like an A&R man for your binary. Within a binary using classifiers to identify potential function starts. Is it really that hard to know when a function starts? I guess, I guess maybe it is. Functions can then be used by the plugin on the original binary or other binaries to find additional functions. That's from the thing. The deciding to classify an address as code and or data is a challenging problem in reverse engineering. Many tools, Ghidra included, ship hard-coded signatures to help find code and function start addresses. Okay, for example, Ghidra has the x86 win patterns.xml that describes common function prologs on Intel 86. So here's the pattern list, just in XML for maximum readability. Um, and I guess it starts with this sequence of hex things. And then there's like this post pattern. I'm not sure how you know. Um, maybe like you, this informs some regex, and this is the beginning of it, and that's the, the end, and you do some sort of regex scan or something. This is probably generated by the Function Bit Patterns Explorer plugin, which is used to discover patterns in the bytes around function starts and turns. In return, when analyzing a single program, such patterns can be used to discover new functions. All right, and so the, okay. Generate a random forest classifier using sequences of code from the current module to decide if each address might be the start of a function. Cool, now I'll read this later. All right, so that's enough for, for Gitra. That was actually uh, pretty fascinating. I um, feel like I should look for something I want to uh, disassemble and, and try it out on more than just my, my toy program. But I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you've tried out Gitra and you think it's cool, let me know. And I think that next week for code reading, I would like to do either um, X Windows or Wayland, one of the two big Linux um, uh, GUI thing, um, GUI libraries or or frameworks or specifications or whatever they're called. Um, if you have a preference um, and you think one uh, would be cooler to see than the other, let me know.